Good afternoon. This is Andrew Skirka. Thank you very much for your interest in my Great Western Loop presentation. Over the last year, I've given this presentation about 40 times, but looking at my schedule, I don't expect to be giving it many more times going forward. So while it's still fresh in my head, I wanted to take an hour this afternoon, put it together as an audio slideshow, and make it available as a DVD. When I give this presentation in front of a live audience, the presentation typically runs for about 45 minutes. I expect that will be the case with this presentation here as well. The one main difference is that in front of a live audience, I'm usually able to host a 10 to 20 minute long question and answer segment. And I've made that part of the presentation available as a separate slideshow. You can find it on this DVD in a folder called Great Western Loop hyphen FAQ. And in that presentation, which goes for about 30 minutes, I answer 12 of the most frequently asked questions that I receive during the question and answer segment. Today is Monday, January 12th. I'm recording this presentation from my parents' house in Seekonk, Massachusetts, where I'm staying for a few days in between presentations in, presentations in Ohio and Connecticut. Before I begin, I want to thank my two main sponsors, Coolmax and Crocs. Their support over the last year has been tremendous, and I greatly appreciate uh, everything that they've done to allow me to have these amazing experiences. I like to start my slideshows with this photo here. It was taken back in 1996, and it's of three friends and I standing on the summit of Mount Washington, which at 6,280 feet is the highest peak in the Northeast. Now 6,280 feet nowadays doesn't seem like much at all, and in fact it's not. But growing up out, just outside of Providence, Rhode Island, Mount Washington kind of defined the ultimate outdoor experience for me. Whenever I went up there on family vacations or trips with friends, I was always taken back by the size of the mountains up there, by the, by the big rivers, by the lack of development. and those experiences really planted the seed for the passion that I have now for the outdoors. That passion for the outdoors really started to take root once I went off to college. I went off to Duke University in 1999 and for my first two summers in college I went out to the Blue Ridge Mountains of the state out in western North Carolina to work at a high adventure summer camp. And every single day I was rock climbing, mountain biking, caving, rafting, and every other week or so we'd have one of our famous shaving cream fights. And during these two summers I was just having a blast. They were absolutely the two most corrupting summers of my life. And I say that they're corrupting because when I went off to Duke, I was on a track for Wall Street. By the time that I graduated high school, I had had internships with Payne Weber, Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce, business development company of Rhode Island, and even an accounting agency. And this experience at Camp Carolina was completely contrary to that. Um, and not only was it just contrary, but I was actually having far more fun spending all of my time outdoors than I was, than I would have, than the amount of fun that I would have been having if I had taken this Wall Street track. Add to that also the people that I was hanging around with, these people who had a very unconventional approach towards life. Uh, they were definitely not like my parents who had instilled in my sisters and I the uh, this very much a, it's a working class attitude that uh, the, what you're supposed to do with your life is get a good degree from college, you get a good job, you get married, have kids, buy a house, retire at 65 and hopefully you've saved enough money to start having fun. So over the, throughout the the course of my Duke career after those two summers at camp, I really struggled with what I wanted to do with my life, which was to go have fun and spend as much time outdoors as possible, versus what I everyone kind of was telling me that I should do with my life, which is take advantage of my Duke education to my intellectual uh, abilities and, and go do something that will contribute in a, a very conventional way to society. But the the unconventional track was definitely starting to win out. In my third summer in college, I hiked the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine in 95 days. The Appalachian Trail, of course, is a 2,170-mile trail, 
It's probably, probably the most famous of the long distance hiking trails in the country. The summer after I hiked the Appalachian Trail, I, I got an internship with Golite in Boulder, Colorado. And that summer I spent every single weekend up in the Indian Peaks Wilderness. And while I was there, I also had the chance to hike the 480 mile long Colorado Trail, which runs from Denver down to Durango. After this summer at, in Colorado, I had kind of decided, at least to myself, that the whole Wall Street thing was done, that I was going to do what I wanted to do with my life, that I needed to make the decisions that were best for me. And I decided that what I really wanted to do was, again, have fun and spend as much time outdoors as possible. After the summer out in Colorado, I went back to school for another semester, finished up at Duke and got my degree. And my parents were really excited about me getting my degree. This was, this was the time when their son was going to go out into the real world and get that job that they had always kind of wanted me to have. And you can imagine then that they were not thrilled at all when I came home after graduating and told them that I was going to hike the C to C route. The C to C route was my first major long distance hike. Uh, the Appalachian Trail is long, but the C to C route is way longer. 7,778 miles, which comes out to about 300 marathons. I started the C2C in August of 2004 up in Gaspé, Quebec. It took me 11 months to hike all the way to the, to the Olympic coast of Washington. And I spent winter on the trail that year. And this was not necessarily the way that I intended it, but I ended up spending January of 2005 in the lower peninsula of Michigan, February in the upper peninsula of Michigan, and March in northern Wisconsin and northern Minnesota. That winter, I snowshoed 1,400 miles. I endured temperatures as low as 20 degrees below zero and was dealing constantly with the challenges of winter. Snow, biting wind, frozen water sources, etc. I want to pause for a second before I get into the Great Western Loop because I think it's very important to address the question of why. Why do I do these long distance hikes? Um, that's probably the most commonly asked question uh, that I receive. So the first reason that I love long distance backpacking is that I've been able to witness some of the most beautiful parts that, of the world. Um, I've now at this point hiked about 22,000 miles most of which have been in the lower 48, but I've also managed to take my travels international now as well. And again and again, I've just been floored by the beauty that's out there. And oftentimes, the beauty is very far from trailheads and very far from civilization. And by foot is really the best and most efficient way to get there. Another reason that I love backpacking is because of the amazing cast of characters that I've met along the way. Particularly during my c to c hike, I was just continually amazed at how people were just so kind and generous and how the media's portrayal of the public just didn't jive with what I was actually experiencing while I was out there. People were opening up their homes to me, telling me their stories, they were introducing me to their families, they were giving me meals and letting me shower. Um, it was again and again just amazing the generosity. One of my favorite individuals that I've ever met is a fellow from northern Minnesota in Silver Bay. His name is Ken Ulkers and he's the chief trail steward of the Superior Hiking Trail which runs along the north shore of Lake Superior. And when I first met Ken it was March of 2005 and Ken uh, wasn't able to do any trail work at that time of year because there was still three or four feet of snow on the ground. So he took me under his wing for two weeks while I was hiking on the Superior Hiking Trail. And he pretty much met me at every single road crossing with hot cocoa and trail mix and just making sure that I was okay. But Ken really surprised me when on, on March 25th, and I was quite a ways away from Silver Bay at this point, and uh, I was coming down to a road that hadn't even been plowed. And I hear Ken just kind of like, you know, yell. and. 
I get down there and Ken is standing there with a with a whole tray of angel food cake because March 25th was my birthday. That's right. Ken had drove four hours round trip getting his truck stuck on this road to bring me angel food cake for my birthday. Another reason that I love to go on these long distance hikes is because it's provided me with an education that's been firsthand, on the ground, extremely comprehensive of a lot of policy matters and uh, academic matters, but I'm learning it, learning it not in a textbook. Uh, I've learned far more about uh, the way that vegetation shifts with elevation or climate uh, or the, the wildfire policies in the West, or about um, grizzly bears by hiking through these areas than I ever would have if I had just learned these things in an academic setting. I always forget to preface this slide, I'm sorry. But the fourth reason that I love long distance backpacking is that it's thrilling to finish up one of these long distance hikes. Um, it still boggles my mind, and this is, again, after having hiked 22,000 miles, that human beings are capable of walking these enormous distances, and we're doing it step by step, mile by mile, day by day. Whenever I start one of these long-distance hikes, it really never seems possible what I'm attempting. Uh, the distance just seems too big. It seems like too much of an effort. So you can imagine then the, the sense of satisfaction and exhilaration when you kinda, I, I kinda end up doing the impossible. This particular photo was taken in January of 2007 after I finished up a 380 mile long trek through northern Minnesota in January. And I'm sure the men out in this audience right now are laughing and saying, wow, that, that box is pretty darn small. But here's the thing, it was five degrees below zero, and I can assure you that if you had been taking this photo of yourself in those conditions, that the box surrounding you would probably be pretty darn small too. And then the last reason I love long distance backpacking, and this is the one to remember, if you're gonna remember any of the reasons I've given you, take home this one here. And that's because when I'm out backpacking, I finally feel alive. It's when I feel like I'm doing exactly what I should be doing, exactly what I want to be doing with my life. As far as I'm concerned, I'm on this planet for 60, 70, maybe 80 years if I'm lucky, 90 if I'm really lucky. And it's up to me to experience as much as I possibly can while I'm here. Uh, I don't want to be on my deathbed and regret the fact that my life wasn't as eventful as it as it could have been, that I didn't see enough of the world, that I didn't get enough experiences. When I'm not backpacking, my life is pretty darn good. I travel a lot. I have great friends, great family. I live in Boulder, Colorado. But my civilian life just doesn't compare to my life when I'm out backpacking. Um, long distance hiking really can maybe be considered um, or be motivated by this consistent string of what I refer to as wahoo moments where everything all comes together be it some amazing sunset or an exciting encounter with a grizzly bear in Montana or catching the last rays of sunlight in Colorado at 12,000 feet in the Indian Peaks wilderness which is what I'm doing in this photo and it all comes together and for a split second I feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world that there is not another human being on the face of the earth who could possibly be more fortunate than I am. I think that's a good segue into the Great Western Loop. Um, I've explained my background, I've explained why I love long distance backpacking, and the Great Western Loop was, in a way, kind of the next logical thing for me to do in my backpacking career. The Great Western Loop is 6,875 miles long, which is equivalent to about 262 marathons. It's a network of six, I'm sorry, five long distance hiking trails, some of which you've probably heard of, like the Pacific Crest Trail or the Continental Divide Trail. Other trails that it includes you might not have heard of, like the Pacific Northwest Trail or the Arizona Trail or the Grand Enchantment Trail. There's also 
in this network of trails a 675 mile gap from the Grand Canyon to Palm Springs, California. The Great Western Loop lives up to its name. It goes through 12 national parks, including a lot of the ones that you would know. Places like Yellowstone, Yosemite, Glacier, Rocky Mountain, Grand Canyon, Rainier, Crater Lake, and it also goes through 75 of um, wilderness areas in the West, including many of the best ones. So uh, places like the Bob Marshall Wilderness in Montana, the Wind Rivers in Wyoming, the John Muir and Ansel Adams Wilderness in California, Glacier Peak Wilderness in Washington. Before I completed the Great Western Loop in November of 2007, it had never been completed or even attempted, and I finished the entire trip in 208 days, which was an average of 33 miles per day. And I will explain in a couple of more slides why I was hiking so fast. Before I even took a step on the Great Western Loop, though, I need to do, needed to do a lot of planning. Part of the planning was just initially just to prove to myself that it was possible. And it started off with a very big question such as, what sort of conditions would I encounter? What sort of gear would I need? What direction would I go? How long would it take? How fast would I need to hike? And then as the date of my departure got closer and closer, my planning became ever more minute to the point where I was rebagging 50 four ounce packages of Idaho and mashed potatoes or repackaging all of my maps and guidebooks into 52 separate Ziploc bags so that they could be sent to predetermined points along my route. And part of my objective in the planning was to make sure that, that this thing was doable, that I wasn't investing seven months of my time and seven months of effort in a trip that just wasn't physically possible. The other objective in my planning was to make sure that I could spend as much time hiking as possible. I didn't want to be bogged down once I got onto the, once I got on the trail with doing little tasks like going grocery shopping or checking my email or finding the necessary chapters of my guidebook or getting in a town and trying to find five days of toilet paper or stove for, or fuel for my stove. So my system was uh, essentially that all of my food and supplies were uh, prepared and packaged ahead of time. My mother would ship supplies to a predetermined location. I would usually to a post office. I'd get to the post office, pick up my packages, walk outside, sort out my food, get a new pair of shoes if necessary, find my new maps and guidebooks, and within two or three hours I would be out of town. And a lot of people, um, they think that in order to put in really long days, say 35, 40, 45 miles, that I must be hiking really, really fast. And that's actually not the case. I just put in, uh, I just hike for many hours a day. A typical day for me is 15 hours, starting at six o'clock in the morning, finishing at about nine o'clock. And over the course of that day, I'm only taking one designated break, usually at one or two o'clock in the afternoon. That break is usually only 25 minutes long. And during it, I will uh, lay down my bivy sack, take off my shoes and socks, stretch out for five minutes, take a 15 minute cat nap, strap my shoes back on and go. And so what's most important then is that I'm really just putting in long days and anything that takes me away from hiking, be it checking my email, having to pay a credit card, buying groceries, etc., that's just inhibiting my ability to put in the miles. On the back end of this big logistical effort is my wonderful mother. And without my mom, I really don't think that I could have pulled off something like the Great Western Loop because she really allowed me to be efficient when I, once I hit the trail. The funny thing about my mom is that she would just as much prefer that I stop hiking and start a normal life. Uh, or as my late grandmother once told me, I wish that you would just find a nice girl. That said, my mom, you know, while she would like to see me do that, she is though still my mother and she'll always love me and she would much rather be involved with what I'm doing and making sure that I'm safe and happy than to not be involved at all. And I have a video clip that I'm gonna show you in a second that I think captures these conflicting emotions of my mother really, really well. But yes, he's leaving on Sunday to be gone for seven months. And how do you feel about that? Truthful? Yeah. 
concerned. I hope that he, I know he's enthused about it. I know he's extremely well prepared, but he is my son. And I just want him to do it safely. Do you think it's going to be a good experience for him? I hope it is. Would you ever want to do something like this yourself? Definitely. Would you ever want to do something like this yourself? I started the Great Western Loop in April of 2007 from the Grand Canyon, and I was moving in a counterclockwise direction, so pretty quickly I was in one of the harshest parts of the country, the Colorado and the Mojave Deserts. Starting at the Grand Canyon was, a, I thought, a very fitting place to do it. Um, it the Grand Canyon, for those of you who have been there, you can probably relate. When I say that the Grand Canyon is the most humbling place that I've ever been, looking out over something like 1.2 billion years of geology from the South Rim, and the Grand, the canyon itself is a fairly new feature of this landscape. It's only about, I believe, about 400, 500, 600,000 years old. But while the Grand Canyon is is one of the most humbling places that I've ever been, it's also one of the most inspiring. Whenever I'm there, I realize that that this place will be here, for, you know, w w or was here long before I arrived, and will be here long after I go. But it's up to me during the short time I have on this planet to to visit places like this, to experience their beauty, and and more than that, though, to learn as much as I possibly can about the world in which I live, uh, both its best and its worst aspects. I spent a couple of days in the Grand Canyon and then popped back out onto the rim and started hiking southwest towards Palm Springs, California. There was no official long distance hiking trail for this section of the route, so I had to make up my own, my own path. And the biggest challenge in hiking across this part of the country is probably water. Um, it's more than water because the landscape itself is the just the harshest, bleakest, most unforgiving landscape that I've ever seen. Um, there's no surface water, there's no shade, temperatures at the end of April were already getting up into the mid-90s and this was one of the most difficult parts of the hike. Thankfully on the other side of this desert is the metropolis of Southern California and despite the residents of Southern California living in a extremely harsh desert they are in this bubble and they think that they're somehow entitled to golf courses and green lawns and swimming pools and long showers and ample water to wash their cars. And on the Great Western Loop, I can't say I was complaining about all that much about this sense of entitlement. Because for much of the distance across the Colorado desert, I was able to follow the Colorado River Aqueduct, which is one of four major aqueducts that allows Los Angeles to exist. Without this water infrastructure, they, the region would just not be able to, to exist in the numbers that it does. The Colorado River Aqueduct is about 242 miles long, which is not even the longest aqueduct. The, the longest aqueduct is the California Aqueduct, which runs from Northern California in the San Francisco Delta area south up the San Joaquin Valley, 3,500 feet over the, San, over the Tehachapi Mountains and dropping down into Southern California. There were some really long stretches I had to go though without water, uh, one of which was, or the longest of which was across Joshua Tree National Park when I had to go 70 miles between reliable sources of water. I started this segment with about 35 pounds of water filled up into seven 2.4 liter platypus bottles. I somehow managed to squeeze them into my tiny little, tiny little jam pack or go light jam pack and I think my ability to do that had something to do with the fact that the rest of the contents of my pack included I believe it was five or six pounds of food and a mere four pounds of gear. I started this segment at 8 o'clock at night, and I had already hiked about 30 miles that day, but I wanted to do as many miles that first night as possible, because if I could 
If I could hike while it was cool, while the sun wasn't beating down on me, then I would probably improve the odds of me reaching Black Rock Canyon um, with enough with enough water. I wouldn't I wouldn't become overly dehydrated and wouldn't get hurt along the way. The first 35 miles or so were across the Pinto Basin, which is this vast sandy expanse in the southwestern corner of the park. It's dotted by these kind of chest-high creosote bushes, and uh, I was, it was an amazing night while I was hiking across this. There was a three-quarter full moon, and I wasn't even I wasn't even having to use my headlamp. I'd taken a bearing on a star earlier in the night, and I was just following the star cross country across the Pinto Basin. And because I'd already hiked so many miles that day, and because it was getting really late, it was now it was like two o'clock in the morning, and I'd been taking these cat naps uh, starting at about 10 o'clock, where I would lay down on the sand for 10 or 15 minutes. I'd wake back up, hike for another hour, take another cat nap, and it was two o'clock in the morning. It I kind of got to this point where I need, needed to make a decision about whether I was going to stop and camp or whether I was going to keep pushing on. I just I was having a real hard time, just fatigued and having a real hard time distilling reality versus dreams. So I stopped for a second and just kind of you know, shook my head around and realized what I was doing. And it was just one of those moments, those wahoo moments where it all came together. Um, I thought for that split second that there was probably no one more fortunate on the face of the earth that that there was no one in the lower 48 who was doing anything nearly as cool as what I was doing. So I just yelled out, I'm like, woohoo! And I wasn't expecting at that point to be responded to by a coyote off to my right who joins me. Ow! And then a coyote off to my left. Ow! And soon, soon there are about a half dozen coyotes all, all kind of howling. And in a way, I almost wonder whether they were sharing my joy, my jubilation for this particular moment. I reached Palm Springs safely with enough water and at that point I started heading north on the Pacific Crest Trail towards Canada. I use this slide to explain two things that you might be wondering about. The first is why I was hiking so fast and the other is why I decided to go clockwise as opposed to counterclockwise. I'll address why I was hiking so fast first. On the Great Western Loop, there are two places that might be described as goalposts. There's the High Sierra in California, which consists of Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park, John Muir and Ansel Adams Wilderness Areas, and Yosemite. And then in Colorado, there's the San Juans down in the southwestern part of the state where, that, where the Continental Divide Trail does that sharp uh, turn. that you can. It's uh, about a 90 degree turn in the southwestern part of the state. Between these two goalposts, there's about 100, I'm sorry, there's a 4,650 miles, and the hiking season is really only about 130 days. Um, there are portions that are hikeable for longer than that, but if I tried to expand that window, I would run into really uncomfortable conditions, uh, be it temperatures and snowfall, uh, but also uh, tremendous avalanche dangers as well. So in order to complete the Great Western Loop in one year, which is what I wanted to do, I decided that I would need to hike the entire thing uh, at an average of somewhere in you know, about 35 miles a day with the ability to go slower both before and after I reached these goalposts. Now as far as the direction goes, uh, I waited until about the middle of February to decide which way I would go, and at that point it was clearly in my best interest to head clockwise because I could go up through the High Sierra earlier in the year than I typically would be able to do. They were in a real drought year in two, the winter of 2006-2007, about one-third of their average snowpack, whereas the San Juans were at uh, something closer to average. So heading north on the Pacific Crest Trail, the first thing that I hit was the High Sierra. And this was now the middle of May. For those of you who are familiar with the trail, I was at Kennedy Meadows on the 14th of May, which is, as far as I know, earlier than just about any other through hiker has ever attempted. What was nice about this particular time of year is that it was too early for the rest of the long distance hikers, but it was too late for all the skiers. So I ended up having the High Sierra all to myself. I went five and a half days without seeing another human being 
in the middle of a 200 mile long stretch without crossing a road. And this was one of the, mo the most special experiences that I had on the Great Western Loop. I think that there, the Great Western Loop itself was what could be described as a triple of a lifetime. But within the Great Western Loop, there were a handful of what I might describe as mini trips of a lifetime, where if you extract it out of the Great Western Loop, it on its own would stand as this incredible backcountry experience. And this was certainly one of them. The High Sierra is, I, I'll have to say, the most magnificent mountain range in the lower 48. And it pains me to say that living now more or less in Boulder, Colorado, but there's nothing really that compares to the High Sierra. It's just this beautiful granite monolith structure, lots of snow, beautiful snow melt, uh, rivers, um, amazing vegetation, black bears. It's a, just a pretty phenomenal place. And what's also most amazing about this is that I was, it's remote enough that I was able to go five and a half days without seeing anybody, even though it's in the most populous state in the country. Made it up through the High Sierra, pushed through Northern California, and arrived in Oregon. When I arrived in Oregon, I began a new mountain chain, uh, the Cascades. The Cascades are fundamentally different in their geology than the Sierra Nevada, much more volcanic in origin, and as a result, there's a lot of volcanic activity, including places like Crater Lake, which is the remnants of an old volcano that pulled its uh, pulled the Mount St. Helens about 400,000 years ago and blew its top, and the caldera that was left over has since been filled in with snow and rainwater. I was also walking along lava fields like these outside of the Three Sisters Wilderness, and it seems like everywhere I looked, be it um, on the horizon or on my topographical map, cinder cones is dotted the landscape. Cinder cones and also volcanoes, like the Three Sisters, which are in the background of this photo. So while the novelty of the Cascades were inspiring and they really kind of kept pushing me forward, I was always wondering what I was going to see tomorrow or what I was going to see next week, it was also the most difficult part of the Great Western Loop. I was there very early in the season. I was up at Crater Lake on the 15th of June and uh, I was exiting the North Cascades of Washington at around July 20th. And this is very early in the season uh, because the Cascades get just a tremendous amount of snow. Um, the folks who live in Michigan or uh, Northern or Chicago or even California or Colorado or Montana, I'm sorry, but you guys just don't get the snow that the Cascades get. Uh, the record the record snowfall for in one year is held, uh, for, this is a world record, is held by Mount Baker, which is up in the North Cascades. And the record, I believe, is something like 1140 inches of snow in one year. That's almost 100 feet of snow in a year. And while that's exceptional, even 50% of the record is still an enormous amount of snow, and it takes just forever to melt off. And as a result of all the snow just kind of sticking around, constantly covering the trails, filling the, filling the rivers with snow melt, um, heavily sun cupped terrain, I was having a really hard time all the way through Oregon and Washington, which was a period that lasted about uh, eight weeks, and it was about, I'm sorry, that can't be right, it was about 900 miles, and I believe it was five, five weeks long. And I have a video clip that I'm going to show here right now that I, um, that demonstrates some of the difficulties that I was having during this section. Welcome to Suncuff Hill. How do you spend your Friday afternoon? Right now I'm on the Packwood Glacier. I can't see a damn thing. This is where I ended up fording right here. So, uh, I had to go upstream a little bit. It wasn't perfect though. I was about way steep and uh, quite, quite so I went a bit. It's a good thing my mother's not out with me this morning because she'd freak out at some of the snow fields that I'm having to cross. Of course, I'm freaking out a little bit.
What's interesting watching those videos now, and I'm very far removed from the Great Western Loop. I finished it about 14 months ago. But what's interesting is to think back about what my mindset was in these particular in these particular situations. There was never any thought about quitting or turning back or waiting it out a week and letting some of the snow melt. That was just never an option. I, I was always, throughout the course of the Great Western Loop, convinced that I was going to reach the Grand Canyon again and that I would manage somehow to overcome any challenge, any adversity that came my way during the course of it. Now, there is that saying out there that it's not the destination, it's the journey. And I firmly believe in that saying. I think it's, it's absolutely true. You can't be focused just on the destination. It's, life is about the journey. That's the experience that, that you're after. But I think what is missing from that statement is that there is a great deal of importance in having a destination. Because if you have that destination, you're far more motivated to push yourself through the adversity um, and, and demonstrate some fortitude in getting there. And imagine if, if you didn't have that destination in mind and you stopped early or you quit, you would you'd basically give up that experience that, um, that you would get otherwise. I reached the Canadian border at the end of July, and at that point I started heading east on the Pacific Northwest Trail. I had done this section of trail as part of my sea to sea hike. You can see it coming in the screen on the right side uh, in, through eastern Montana. And so I won't talk about it for very long, but there was one really important section, one, one really important event that happened during this part of the hike. And that's the reaching of the halfway point. When I reached the halfway point, I was near Bonners Ferry, Idaho, but I wasn't able to do or wasn't able to celebrate the reaching of the halfway point until I was in Eureka, Montana. And when I, when I reached Eureka, I took on what hikers call the half-gallon challenge. It's a way to congratulate ourselves on a job well done on the first half of our hike, a way to give a toast to the second half. Now, on the Great Western Loop, when I reached my halfway point, I was, I was 3,400 and 50 miles or so into my hike, and I'd figured I'd earn more than some half gallon of mediocre ice cream like Hershey's or Briars. So I went for the good stuff and got four pints of Ben and Jerry's, Cherry Garcia, Brownie Batter, Chunky Monkey, and one last pint of Brownie Batter. It took me about two hours to, to put them all down, and you can see my body temperature precipitously dropping as we move along here. And after this whole thing was over, I flipped the pints around to see what I had just consumed. I wanted to know how many calories and how many grams of fat. And it turns out that in a, in a two-hour sitting, I consumed 4,250 calories and 256 grams of fat. For those of you not familiar with the metric system, 256 grams of fat is almost 10 ounces of fat. I reached Glacier National Park, and I was excited about reaching Glacier. It's one of my most favorite national parks, probably top three with the North Cascades and the Olympics. But when I was hiking through Glacier this time, it was a little bit more somber than it has been in the past. And that's because when I left for the Great Western Loop, the um, public was really finally starting to talk about climate change and how climate change was going to affect us and how we were going to have to change our ways if we were either going to try to um, prevent further damage or reverse the damage that we've already created. In a place like Glacier, um, the effect of climate change is very clear on this area. Um, we're seeing the namesake feature of the park, its glaciers, melt rapidly, um, abnormally fast. Um, this is a time-lapse series of Grinnell Glacier, which is one of the largest glaciers in the park over the last 80 years, and you can see the rapid melting of this glacier. And they're actually expecting that within another 20 years or so that Grinnell Glacier will cease to exist, that it will disappear, either, either it will become just a permanent snow field or it will melt entirely by the end of the summer. This... Um, Throughout the course of this hike, I w it wasn't just at Glacier National Park that I was asking the question of uh, how climate change will affect the backcountry areas, but it was throughout the course of this hike. And 
again and again, it real, I realized that, that the impact on these backcountry areas um, is not just going to be aesthetic like it kind of is in Glacier, but it will have significant ramifications or the effects will have significant ramifications on our ability to exist on this planet. One particular implication has to do with our supply of fresh water, particularly in the West where we rely almost exclusively on the winter snowpack for fresh water, uh, where we get these, these giant storms off of the Pacific, they drop lots of snow up in the higher elevations, and then for six months a year it doesn't really rain or snow at all. Uh, and by the end of the summer everything is really dry and the only way that we have water is because nature is kind of has this natural freezer up high and is keeping the springs and the streams full of water. There have been two very important trends with snowpack in the West. Uh, the first trend is that we're seeing a lot less of it and this is because more of the snowpack is actually coming down as rain rather than snow. The other trend that we're seeing is that the peak melt-off date is getting earlier and earlier. So instead of peak flows being say May 15th, they might now be May 1st. And this has big ramifications because late in the year, say the end of August, the end of September, the beginning of October, when it hasn't rained for months and months, um, and when we need a lots of water for residential and for agricultural use, we don't have it around. Another big implication of climate change in the West has been the mountain pine beetle. The mountain pine beetle has always been part of the Western ecosystem, but it's, the populations have always been kept in check by nature's two defense mechanisms, wildfires and cold winters. Federal land managers have done an excellent job in suppressing fires for the last 75 years. The policy has been completely misguided, but they've done an excellent job at it. And then uh, that combined with the fact that human beings as a, as a as worldwide are making the planet warmer, we've taken away nature's two defense mechanisms and the, the mountain pine beetle population has absolutely exploded all over the West. In Colorado in particular, the experts are expecting that within the next five years, something like 90% of the lodgepole pines in Colorado will be killed off by the mountain pine beetle. And this is not only a, an eyesore to see all these dead snags on all of our mountainsides, but it's also, it also creates a really scary wildfire scenario. While climate change is, is really important, in fact it might be the biggest challenge that my generation will, will face, I think we need to think of it a little bit more broadly in the context of environmental stewardship, or perhaps the lack of environmental stewardship. Over the course of the mile, over the course of my hikes, one thing that has happened is that nothing is, nothing anymore is out of sight, out of mind. Uh, I've walked past open pit copper mines in places like Arizona. I've walked by clear cuts up in the northwest. I've seen incredible sprawl outside of western metropolitan areas like Phoenix or Southern California or Denver, Las Vegas. And all this is combined to, uh, to make us, in a way, I think, uh, poor environmental stewards. I feel like we've been given this earth, we're the dominant species, and, and we need to be thinking more of ourselves as trustees, trust, trustees of the land. That we inherit the planet from future generations, and then it's our responsibility to pass it along to, uh, uh, to generations after us in the same sort of health that, that we inherited it. Instead, we're doing just the exact opposite. Um, just in story after story after story, we're degrading the planet, uh, devastating its species, collapse of fisheries, pollution of air and water, and the list goes on. I think what's most frustrating to me, though, as um, in all of this, is that I, I don't feel that bad environmental stewardship is necessary at all to increase our standard of living. In fact, I would say that it's completely contradictory towards it. As a backpacker, and specifically as a lightweight backpacker, I've learned some, or have adopted some philosophy to, philosophies towards life that are very contrary to uh, the American culture, which seems to maybe be summed up best as bigger is better and more is better. And as a backpacker, I've learned just the opposite, that 
if I can find a way to eliminate redundancies and keep things simple, and if I can find a way to do more with less, then that actually is far better. My first backpacking trip was the Appalachian Trail back in 2002. And when I started the Appalachian Trail, I uh, kind of looked like the, uh, the more is better, or I was an embodiment of the more is better philosophy. I had this huge hulking backpack with stuff lashed to the outside and a pair of big heavy hiking boots. And within the very first hill, I realized that, that this big heavy backpack with all this stuff was completely ruining my experience. It was making me uncomfortable, my feet hurt, it was distracting me from the experience that I wanted to have. And ever since the first day in the Appalachian Trail, I've been on this quest to continually reduce the weight of my pack. And I found that by doing that, I'm able to enjoy the experience a lot more. I'm far more comfortable, I can move easier, I can fully focus on what's around me instead of what's in my backpack. This photo in the slide here was taken in southwestern Colorado up in the San Juans overlooking the East Fork of the Gunnison River. I'm standing at about 12,500 feet and I don't think you can find a happier person. And the funny thing about it is that inside my backpack I'm carrying a mere eight pounds of gear and about four or five pounds of food. Perhaps not surprisingly this philosophy about backpacking, um, this, this lightweight approach towards backpacking, has been adopted um, by a lot of other long distance hikers, not just in the way that we pack for a hike, but also in our lifestyles. What we've realized is that if we can minimize our belongings, if we can stay independent, um, that we can focus on the things that are most important to us. And I'm not in necessarily encouraging everyone out there to become a long distance backpacker. But I would encourage everyone to take a step back for a second and ask themselves what's most important to them and then try to shape their life around those things. And most people are going to say things like, well, my family is really important, my friends are important, my relationship with God is important. I would also hope that people would add two other things, those being uh, the relationship with, with nature and I also think it's important to have a good relationship with yourself. You've got to be comfortable with who you are and what you do if you're going to if you're going to give to anyone. The other thing to note about this lightweight approach towards backpacking and towards life is that it's also far more environmentally sustainable. We're consuming less, we have a much smaller footprint on on the earth, and that's great because there's no contradiction between the life that we live as backpackers and the life that we live as civilians. The gentleman in the bottom right hand corner of this slide here, his name is Nimblewill Nomad and he, in the video that I'm going to show in a second, he gives this really elo elegant, elegant poem that I think uh, really captures the spirit of the long distance hiker and talking about how well we might not have um, the conventional life and the toys and things that Americans are supposed to have, we are some of the happiest people around. And that that's truly what life is about. It's about being happy. Okay, Andy, this is just, this is for us. This is for you and for me. It's, an, it's especially for people like us. It's entitled Land of the Free. It goes like this. Here's to all hearts of that cold, lonesome track to the life of the wanderlust, free, to all who have gone and have never come back. Here's a tribute to you and to me. With our feet in the dirt, we're the grit of the earth. Heads are riding the heavens, look up there. Heads are riding the heavens or head. And they won't find a nickel of value or worth when our fortunes are tallied in red. But no richer clan has there ever been known yeah. since the times of all ruin and rack yeah. than those of us lost to the dust outward blown who have gone and have never come back. It's it's a special poem, Andy. It's sure is, Nimble. And I, I'm just, I was just the medium through which that came. I mean, there was a couple words in there I had to look up in the damn dictionary. To see what they did.
After getting out of Glacier National Park, I started heading south on the Continental Divide. In this stretch of the Continental Divide, approximately between the areas of Glacier National Park and southern Colorado, is home to many of the most amazing backcountry areas in the lower 48. It includes places like the Bob Marsh Wilderness. It includes very remote areas along the Montana-Idaho border, including a locations such as this near Lem Lemhi Pass. I'm looking west in, into Idaho towards the Tendoy Mountains and near this in this photo I can't see a farmhouse, I can't see a gravel road, no barbed wire fences, not even any cattle. And Lemhi Pass of course is where Lewis and Clark first crossed the divide back in 1805 and this is a landscape that really hasn't changed all that much if at all since they were there over 200 years ago. This stretch of trail also includes some of our best national parks like Yellowstone and Rocky Mountain. It includes, includes amazing wilderness areas like the Wind River Range. And then places you've never heard about like the, like the Great Divide Basin in southern Wyoming, which is just this vast expanse, in, uh, habitationless expanse in southern Wyoming that's just full of sagebrush. And then finally, this stretch of trail finishes up in Colorado where I live nowadays. This particular photo is taken in the, near, taken in the Saywatch Range in the peak of Aspen season. When I got down to southern Colorado, it was the end of September, and long-distance hikers on the Continental Divide Trail are all pushing south and trying to get out of Colorado by the end of the month. The statistics show that it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when the first winter storm hits and progress is either slowed greatly or stopped entirely. And it would be, it would be a shame for a hiker having walked through Montana, Wyoming, and most of Colorado to have their through hike halted by, by the weather. So we're all pushing through at the end of September, the beginning of October, trying to escape the, the oncoming winter. Unfortunately for me, I I got hit by one of these early winter storms, but it wasn't the snowstorm that I had always feared. It was actually a rainstorm. And I suppose that I should have feared the rainstorm more because this particular rainstorm dropped about two inches of rain up in the mountains. And it was also a cold rain. It was um, temperatures barely above freezing, 33, 34, 35 degrees. It started raining at night at about eight o'clock. And I'd kind of been warned of this big storm coming in, but the forecasts that I'd received from other hikers and hunters were really vague. So I continued to hike in the dark for another hour and a half to get to this, uh, to get to a timbered saddle up on the divide, which was the only place where I could find a protected campsite for miles and miles. Most of the divide is similar, is like what you see in this photo, where you're up really, really high. 11, 12, 13,000 feet, you're way above tree line, you're exposed to everything when you're up there. So it's raining all that night, I woke up at midnight, woke up at two o'clock, woke up at four o'clock, still just pouring down rain, and it is freezing cold, the wind is howling. Got up at six o'clock, or actually 5.45 when I normally wake up, and it was still pouring, so I said, you know what, I'm going back to bed, I haven't slept in in six months. So I went back to bed and got up at 8, and it was still pouring rain. And this kind of really surprised me because most storms in Colorado don't last for 12 hours, never mind, actually, I'm sorry, they normally don't last for more than an hour, never mind 12 hours. So I packed up my stuff as quickly as I could, threw on my pack, and started running down the Continental Divide, trying to get warmed up and trying just to make miles. And... Within about half hour, I realized that this day had hypothermia written all over it. Despite running down the trail, uh, I just could not get warm. The, the weather was this, this blast of, it'd be a blast of cold rain and then sleet and a little bit of snow and then hail and more rain. And this, the whole time, it's the blowing at 15, 20, 30 miles an hour. Uh, I, just, I just couldn't be up there any longer. So I decided to bail off of the Continental Divide. And in this photo, which is a, it's actually not a photo, it's a, it's a map from Google Earth, the divide is up near the horizon, and I started bushwhacking down the Piedra Creek Valley, which is that valley on the right side of the slide, 
and I bushwhacked down, I think about 10, 11, 12 miles. I was following game trails and having to climb up and over and under blowdowns. I had to cross Piedra Creek twice, and of course it was just this flooded nightmare of a creek. One of the fords I got swept downstream 15 or 20 feet, submerged up to my neck. I get down to the close to the bottom of the valley, and my goal was to reach that forest road, which you can see in the bottom right-hand corner of the frame. And unfortunately, though, I was I got blocked by a 200-foot-high waterfall in Piedra Creek. It was this deep canyon, uh, and there's just no way for me to get down. So I came up slope, hiked towards the left, and I got into that V-shaped gully there. And unfortunately, there was another big cliff. It was about 50 feet high pretty much vertical, and I was like, you know, I, I can't go down this thing either. So I kept wandering out further and further across the slope, and I got above those tall cliffs, which turned out to be 750 feet high. And I realized that I was, that I was cliffed out, that I couldn't keep going down, that I was going to have to go head back up to the divide and hike another 20 miles once I reached the divide out to the next highway crossing, Wolf Creek Pass. The next, I camped that, that morning, barely got any sleep. I was freezing cold. Um, I, uh, all of my stuff had gotten wet from getting submerged by the creek and just the drenching rain. Next morning, woke up. The, the storm had cleared out a little bit, but it was still blowing hard and it was cold. Got to the divide and started hiking south towards Wolf Creek Pass. And you've got to understand my condition at this point. I'm completely leaned out after having hiked about... Uh, about 5,500 miles. I, you know, just hardly any bat, hardly any body fat, hardly any reserves. I'd gone about three days without sleep, and I had had to stretch uh, a day and a half worth of food over three days. About three miles from Wolf Creek Pass, so I'm almost at the pass now, and it's approaching dark. I encounter one of the great, greatest instances of trail magic that I've ever heard of. Trail magic is the way that long distance hikers uh, refer. Um, the way that we talk about gifts from the God, um, things that come totally unexpectedly uh, and totally they lift your spirits and uh, compel you to keep pushing on. And I have a video clip here that, uh, that shows this instance of trail magic. You're not going to believe this. Today I've had two balance bars and two ounces of dried couscous. And on the trail here, about three miles from... Wolf Creek Pass, I just found a package of yo-yos. That's the most unbelievable thing ever. It looks as if it was dropped here sometime yesterday or the day before. It's filthy dirty, but these are going to be the best yo-yos I've ever had. Now, what's so funny about this, uh, this particular video is I remember finding these ho-hos on the trail and Clearly from this photo, you can see that I am out of it. I'm completely out of it. And I pick up this package of ho-hos and immediately grab my camera. And before starting the video, I was thinking, you know what? You actually might not have just found ho-hos. You might be hallucinating about the fact that you've just found ho-hos. But in any case, I figured, well, I'm either going to capture this whole thing on camera, this great instance of trail magic, or it's going to be even a better video clip because I'm hallucinating over this, the fact that I have just found this thing on the trail. Made it out of Colorado, started heading through New Mexico, and finishing up the trail through Arizona. This was a beautiful s stretch of trail. The conditions definitely were easier. The weather was mostly cooperative. Uh, fall was definitely arriving in the southwest. Um, but really, the trip itself had climaxed in Colorado. It's where the scenery had, had peaked out. It's also where the physical challenge had as well. I knew once I got out of the San Juans that I was, so long as I didn't, something you know, really kind of uh, tragic happened to me over the last thousand miles, that I was going to make it back to the Grand Canyon. I reached the Grand Canyon about two days earlier than I'd expected, and I told my parents that I would finish on a Saturday so that, so that, that way they could come and join me for the finish. But I was there two days early, and this was actually turned out to work. This turned out to work really well. I jumped down into the canyon for the last 48 hours of my trip, 
And it was just kind of this great way to uh, reconnect with almost like a former version of myself. I had started this trip seven months earlier, 6,875 miles earlier. And when I started, I was definitely, I definitely had this tremendous appreciation for the outdoors and, and love backpacking. But um, after all those miles and all those months, that passion for the outdoors, that respect, that sense of humility had grown even more. I finish up my slideshow with a one last video clip. It was taken in the Three Sisters Wilderness in Oregon. And what I like so much about this video clip is that it, it captures a lot of the excitement, the enthusiasm for the experience that I was having. And I'm sure a lot of you out there are avid uh, outdoorsmen and love getting out there, but uh, some of you might not be. And, uh, I think what's most important though is what, that everyone have some sort of passion and don't just have a passion but be excited about it and, get, and let it be the reason that you wake up in the morning. And I hope that whatever you do in life and whatever you're most passionate about it, I hope that you can carry through with as much excitement and enthusiasm as I seem to have in this final video clip. This scene is unbelievable. You see like the guts of the earth and all this fun. These huge glaciers, evening sunlight, oh my god, this doesn't get any better. This is uh, probably, it, perhaps the best day of the entire trip so far. Definitely top two, top three. This is why I come out here days like this. Alright, well thank you very much. If you're interested in learning more about my Great Western Loop hike, you can visit my website, andrewskirka.com. If you're uh, still looking for more information, as I mentioned in the introduction, you can uh, find the other folder on this DVD called Great Western Loop FAQ and um, here are the questions to the most frequently asked questions, or here are the, my answers to the most frequently asked questions that I receive during the question and answer segment. Thank you again for listening, over and out.